so glad to uh, welcome you, and others will come sneaking in, I'm sure, as the music stops and the 8 o'clock is over. Uh, Dr. Robert Jonas, standing right here to my left, uh, is a friend and a wonderful mentor. Some of us yesterday got to sit and listen for a while, and you're going to get to do some of that this morning for a limited time. Robert is the founder and director of the Empty Bell Contemplative Center in Massachusetts. He's a writer, he's a musician, he's a videographer, he's a, a human being. He's a human being. <laughs> what are you going to be when you grow up? <laughs> All of those things. Uh, over here behind the camera, hiding behind the camera, is uh, Margaret Bullet Jonas, so Robert's wife. She's an Episcopal priest uh, in Massachusetts and uh, going to be preaching next Sunday, the 24th, here at Grace St. Paul. So you look forward to that. And today is uh, a little bit of compact information about the Trinity as modes of consciousness. I don't know how you're going to do it in 45 minutes, but you're on. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your water. Oh yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Roger. It's great to be here again and be in Tucson. Uh, and uh, it's not just because of my sh sore shoulder, because of shoveling snow that I have. Did you say but that ten times? In a row? <laughs> sore shoulder. So Whoa, I've got to train myself in that. Uh, we did have some huge storms up there, and uh, it's been very cold, so it's wonderful to be here and just take in the sun. And uh, I love this topic uh, of the Trinity. And um, yesterday I gave a short retreat, three hours on the Trinity to folks here, and um, I'll be doing the same next Saturday uh, at uh, St. Phillips in the Hills. And, uh, and I'll be giving a talk on the Trinity tomorrow night at the Benedictine Monastery on Country Club Road. Uh, so uh, I'm thinking and being the Trinity uh, pretty continuously these days. And it's not a topic that everybody's interested in. As soon as you say the word Trinity, some people go, ouch, I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, <laughs> you know, because we don't understand it, it seems like it's uh, a doctrine that's kind of become uh, covered with moss, if you will. And, but I found something really exciting in the Trinity, and uh, I want to share that with you today. I was going to begin by paint, playing the flute. She's the organ. <laughs> <laughs> she I, I shortly. I don't want to compete yeah, with the organ, so I can do that later. Um, I do play this bamboo flute uh, from the Japanese Buddhist tradition, and um, I always integrate it with my talks a little bit. Um, so this is a huge topic, this Trinity. And uh, I realized yesterday in giving the retreat that I could spend, I could lead a one-week retreat or a 10-day retreat on the Trinity, which would take, uh, give us enough time to let things percolate uh, because there's so much here. And it's so, uh, you know what, I just really realized it, this is in between you and me. There you go. Uh, so uh, I'm going to give you a quick overview and maybe when we, Margaret and I come here uh, every winter, maybe next year I'll lead a longer retreat on the Trinity, and by then people will have had time to realize that it's bigger than they thought. Um, so let me give you this, this quick overview. Um, Trinity, tr the word triune is used sometimes. And um, traditionally we think of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're all familiar with that language. Sometimes this other language is used. Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. Uh, are there others? Uh, Margaret or Roger, are there other phrases that are used? Liberator instead of Redeemer. Liberator. Liberator, Redeemer. Uh, well, we have Redeemer, yeah. Um, and Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost is used, yeah. Um, first, second, and third person of the Trinity. And, and there's first, second, third, yeah. We, uh, the, and persons. The first, second, and third persons, which is a very interesting word. That's our English translation uh, of the uh, Greek, Greek. And, um, and in the New Zealand prayer book, yeah. the Lord's Prayer is Father and Mother. Ah, mm. Father and Mother, very good. Yes, we have this problem because uh, Margaret and I joke about this a little bit. In, in theology schools, people study this so much that you start to get humorous about it. And uh, some folks say, what's the phrase that's used sometimes? It, a man, a boy, a bird. A man, <laughs> a, man a boy, and a bird. <laughs> uh, and sometimes humor helps. Humor helps us navigate the territory a little bit. Um, 
We were created in the image of God in Genesis. The image and likeness of God. That's an interesting phrase there. Image and likeness. <coughs> and, the, uh, and the Latin, imago Dei. Imago, we are the image of God. That's who we are created in that image. Um, when we get to the New Testament, we're created in the image of God, but now we understand God as a trinity. So now our understanding is we are imago trinitatis. We are created in the image of the trinity. So this is a, this is a Jewish Christian transposition. And this is where we find ourselves, but we're, we're in the same tradition, but it's morphed a little bit. It's changed. So what does that mean that we're created in the image of the Trinity, and how would that be different if it is from Imago Dei? So that's something we can talk about. Now, the first person of the Trinity, who is the first per? Well, let me go back. Uh, uh, the great councils that came up with the creeds, um, uh, there was the Council of Chalcedon, which dealt mostly with who is Jesus. That was the big question there, because there were a lot of controversies. Who is this person? One question was, is, is Jesus more human or more divine? Or some combination? Is he 60% human and 40% divine? And there were dozens of heresies, what came to be called heresies. Um, the the uh, heresy of Arianism said that Jesus was a completely human person, just like all of us, um, but that he was a specially gifted teacher. A wisdom teacher, and this this uh, quote, quote unquote heresy is still around. There, some of us even you know believe that, and that's uh, I would say heresies are um, it's it's an unfortunate word because there are delicate, sensitive di differences among all these understandings. But uh, Arianism is it was the reason that the Council of Chalcedon happened because there were so many uh, uh, leaders in the church that felt that that was an adequate an adequate understanding of who Jesus is. So they went in and they uh, looked at the extremes. And one extreme, Arianism, is that what said that Jesus was completely human being, a gifted human being. But the other extreme, and I don't know if this is Apollinarius or I forget the name of the heresy, but that Jesus was completely divine, not human at all, that he only appeared to be human. Almost got the name in my mind. I'll come up with it in a moment. He just appeared to be human. And so you have completely human, completely divine at two extremes. And what Chalcedon came up with in their final decision after being together for weeks was that Jesus is <coughs> completely human and completely divine. Simultaneously. 100%. 100% human, 100% divine. <laughs> he didn't, uh, pardon? I said it's good Anglican thinking. Yes, right, right. Even before Anglicanism <laughs> appeared, that's right. <laughs> they knew it was coming. So it's 100%. Uh, and this boggles the mind. How can somebody, something be 100% two things that are different? Human and divine, they're two different things. Or uh, finite and eternity. Because God is eternal and humans are mortal. How could these be the same? in one person. This was the big question. And for them to come up with this apparently paradoxical statement that God is both um, was, was courageous, let's say at least, uh, because it, would, it boggles the rational mind. So, but this, is, this was a, a really important council. And then we have the creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Creed of Nicaea. It turns out, I, I've learned in my research, is different than the Nicene Creed. And each, how they differ is that the Apostles' Creed was, um, it emerged early, somewhere around the year 200. And uh, in the Apostles' Creed, you can't quite tell that either Jesus or the Spirit is divine. It's not quite said that way. Um, so that's why Unitarians can agree with the Apostles' hmm. Creed. Um, but in the Creed of Nicaea, Jesus is God from God, light from light, clearly Jesus is Jesus Christ, fully fully human and fully divine. But the Spirit is not necessarily named as fully divine, this, uh, which is interesting. The Spirit becomes fully divine in the Nicene Creed. Now all three are fully divine. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the first and second, third persons are all fully divine. So this was a development in Christian thinking. 
And uh, it took uh, almost four centuries for this to happen, for the Nicene Creed to come. There's one slight difference that's kind of interesting. If some of you have had experience in the Orthodox tradition, uh, the Spirit proceeds from the Father, but not from the Son. And this is the, the uh, uh, statement that God <coughs> proceeds, that uh, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, which is what we say in the Nicene Creed. Um, that's called the filioque, from the Son. So the Spirit comes for us from the Father and from the Son. And to me, it's kind of, I don't know how, I, I need to talk to an Orthodox friends about how they could say this because it's clear in Scripture that Jesus says he'll send the Spirit. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think the Orthodox argument is yeah. it wasn't that way when we all agreed to it. You added it. Oh, yes. But it's not that we don't agree with it. Uh -huh. It's just that it was bad for it to stick it in without consulting the whole church. Right, okay. That, yeah, There's a, there are political reasons. And it's also somehow connected with the rejection of the papacy, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, the Orthodox. <coughs> yeah, there's some politics involved here. Now, I, I would say that, uh, there are certain theologians and thinkers and writers out there, I'm thinking of Elaine Poggles and uh, others, who um, just reject the whole idea of the creeds um, because they say it was just a political thing. Const the Emperor Constantine convened this, uh, these councils and it was his way to try to dominate the, the Mid-Eastern Eastern world with this official religion, Christianity. And so some, there are some people who say it was just a political thing. And I don't agree with that. I feel like there's some, there's some deep mis mystery in, of um, who we are in these creeds. It's unfortunate that the creeds have, been, have gradually come to be recited kind of in a rote way. We just, uh, I've been rereading uh, Julian of Norwich, Hildegard of Bingen, Marguerite Porette. Uh, and other women theologians from the Middle Ages. And they're very free in their language about men and women. Very free. In fact, there's, there's a talk of Jesus as mother. Jesus, my mother. And so you, you end up with this kind of a anthrop anthropomorphic, this figure who uh, has no gender, who's the second person. It's the appearance of the invisible God in a person. And that could be a man or a woman. And I love that. I love that. It almost makes me cry. You know, let's, it's, it's, uh, it, things are changing in the Christian church. We're in the middle of a revolution, I think, and it's going to be going on for hundreds of years, really. But we're rethinking everything, and uh, I feel myself to be part of that great conversation. Whilst remaining rooted in the original tradition, we, we can see how it's grown, and it continues to grow and change. And... Uh, I'm in the mix of people who go out giving talks like Marguerite, not Marguerite Porette, God bless her. I'll say more about her later. Um, she's here, but she's not physically here anymore. 14th century. Um, thinking of Cynthia Bourgeau uh, and Joan Chister, um, Lawrence Freeman and John Main, John Main, God bless him, and um, Father Keating, Thomas Keating, and Richard Rohr, and James Finley, David Steinorast, all these. Uh, beautiful Christian teachers out there right now at the forward edge of thinking of who are we? Who are, we're in the midst of this revolution and there's a phrase called non-dual consciousness which is coming up. It's about how, how, we, how we think, how we feel, how we put together our whole world. And this phrase now that's beginning to arise and it, and it grows right out of this tradition. It makes perfect sense but it's our modern language. We talk about Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness. And I've been thinking about this for, I don't know, 10 years, more than that, 15, 20 years. What was, the, what was Jesus' consciousness? How did, he, how did he experience God? And one of my favorite theolo theologians is Karl Rahner, a Catholic theologian who's now passed away from Germany. And he, he has a, a beautiful essay on Christ's consciousness. And... Um, it's wonderful, it's uh, groundbreaking, because he says that for Jesus, when Jesus prayed, he didn't have an image of God. There is no image of God. But So who was God for Jesus when he prayed to the Father? He didn't have an image of a Father in his head. What he, what he, his whole consciousness had, was abiding at a, at a horizon of knowing and not knowing. The horizon, like, think of 
an image of the planet Earth where there's a, that beautiful horizon where the Earth is turning over and we can't see the other side. We're turning over into something that in Jesus' consciousness was a horizon of the <coughs> finite and the infinite. And that everything he experienced was occurring at that horizon of the finite and the infinite, where the finite turns over into the infinite. And the infinite turns back into the finite. That was Jesus' consciousness. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> I think it's incredible. Because <laughs> I never thought about that. What did he mean when he said Father? You know? So let me go backwards now and, and um, sort of define the, and everything I'm saying here, you, you know, really take, um, be mindful that uh, it's not, what I'm talking about is not different from us being here right now in our bodies, in this space listening to the organ, we're in Tucson, we're on this planet. Uh, this, everything I'm talking about is not different from what's actually happening. Somehow the Trinity is happening right now within us as we are with each other. So uh, I'm just saying that because what, I, I, I grew up Lutheran and I, I grew up in a tradition where God was sort of out there. You know, it's about another time, another, and I can be reverent, I can be devotional, but it's not now, it's not happening now. Eternal life is later. Eternal life is not now. And this is the whole idea of, in Christ consciousness, that it is happening now. The incarnation is happening now. We are participating in the incarnation now. Wow. You know, that almost brings tears to my eyes, too. I just feel it. Oh, my God. Is, if that is true, that changes everything. It changes everything. I'm not who I thought I was. You're not who you thought you were. We're not who we thought we were, <laughs> are. Um, so that's why I get really excited about this topic. So let me, uh, let me just kind of unpack the persons. The word person comes from uh, the Greek hypostasis. This is what the Greek fathers used for the word person. So they didn't say persons, they said hypostasis. And we translate it as persons. But, they, but essentially what it means is that we are of the same substance as God. And God is essentially something personal and interpersonal. That's what they mean. There's something, it's not an impersonal thing that's happening here. It's not just an I-it kind of relationship. It's essentially and ultimately we are in participating in a web of something personal and impersonal at every moment. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. So, and so the Trinity is this <coughs> ultimate dance of an inter, an in, it's an interpersonal dance. Now, I have to come back here in a second because I forgot to say something. This word perichoresis. When all these mostly guys, and I'm, I, I just think there were influential women involved here, that, but we don't know who they are, um, came up with this, uh, this word perichoresis. Now, uh, what, what is that? They, they were trying to imagine, given the scripture story, given their prayer lives and so on, what is the inner life of the Trinity? What is the inner life? What's going on there? Can, do we have any words that we could use to describe ultimate reality? And the closest they could come is perichoresis. So, peri means around, and choresis has various translations, but the one that I like is dance. Hmm. Dance around. That the inner life of God is a dance around of love. Isn't <laughs> that great? <laughs> That's the inner life of God. So, uh, and I mentioned this yesterday, we say the word God, and these days it's problematic because people have so many definitions of God, and all kinds of images come to mind. Plus, God sounds like a noun, like God, like this. But you, uh, God's not solid, and God has no location. So it's not like that. It's like when we say the word God, if you could instantly somehow translate that as a, as a dance of love that's going on everywhere all the time. Before we were born, while we're here, and after we die, the dance of love is going on. And 
when we are born and we enter into this life, we enter into the dance of love. We're invited into the dance of love. You don't have to participate. We don't have to participate. God didn't create us to be robots, to do it a certain way. God gave us freedom, which is a big problem for us because we don't know how to deal with actually being free. We make crazy choices, uh, unfortunate choices. But the freedom is there, and if we fully practice our freedom, we step into this dance, the dance around of love, the perichoresis. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So that's who God is. And Jesus is fully human and fully divine, not one or the other. And I'm going to take a drink. Okay. First person of the Trinity. The first person is some the words that have been used through the centuries. Uh, God, the, the uh, God Almighty, the Father is also unmanifest. Uh, there are no words or uh, no images uh, of God. There are no definitions uh, that are adequate to describe God. Everything we say about God is not God. God is always greater. Um, there's a word, uh, phrase used by theologians, negative theology. Negative theology doesn't mean bad, negative bad. It means that God is not this, not that. <laughs> Whatever we say God is, God is always greater. And I love the freedom of that, that no, no human being can nail down God. No denomination can nail down God, unfortunately or not. <laughs> um, and maybe even no particular faith can nail down God. Because God is unmanifest in the uh, Muslim tradition. Ultimate reality is unmanifest in the Buddhist tradition. Ultimate reality is unmanifest in the Hindu tradition. Unnamed, unnameable, unknown, cannot know God in the way we know anything else. Emptying and kenosis is where the first person connects with the second person. We have in Philippians the um, self-emptying of Christ. The self-emptying of Christ reflects the self-emptying of God. That God empties God's self to, to create creation separate from God. <coughs> so that creation can love God back so that it can be a full circle of love. God empties God. God could be, ultimate reality could be, wouldn't have to create creation, wouldn't have to create us. That was a free choice. Uh, this is our tradition, this is our faith. I feel like a Navajo storyteller. <laughs> there are holy stories. Um, and this is not, uh, we were talked about science yesterday. This is not, uh, we, can, we can still believe in the Big Bang and the whole uh, evolutionary story. That there's no, to me, there's no conflict. Um, that God creates evolution, if you will, because God allows for the creative evolutionary process. God empties God's self. God could, create, <coughs> God could have created us as robots to do exactly what God says, but God didn't do it that way. So it's the self-emptying of God, allowing freedom, and then we have leading into the second person. Someone appears on the planet Earth who is, is, in a way, also unnameable, is self-emptying in love. The love that, that this person <coughs> receives from the first person, the self-emptying is still going on as we get to the second person. And if we look from the scientific point of view, this is going on over billions of years, this whole process. We're just a, a tiny gl glitch, glitch of time in a in a vast process that is going on. The second person appears, Anthropos, a human being, uh, in scripture named Anthropos, not male, um, in, uh, and son-daughter. Uh, my mentor was Henry Now, and some of you know that, uh, the writer of the Catholic priest. He always said, his phrase that he used just about every talk he gave, um, is that Jesus' story is our story. Jesus' story is our story. Jesus is inviting us into the to participate in the incarnation. Uh, he's not just he's the incarnate one, but he gives it away to us. He he does is doing the self-emptying. 
And um, this is in scripture. Oh, wow. Okay. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Now, I mentioned this yesterday too, but I grew up Lutheran with the Lutheran Jesus picture that was uh, yeah, uh, in every Lutheran church. And uh, you've all seen it. I wish I had brought a copy. Uh, with Jesus is the long hair, and he looks he looks European sort of, but he has a kind of you know bigger nose and everything. And maybe he's Jewish, maybe he's from Germany or something. I don't know. But there's that was that Jesus. And when I grew up in a in an alcoholic family with the violence, and uh, I was in trouble with the law, I I was really out of control and very angry. But I could pray, and this Jesus gave me hope that there was somebody who loved me, and I identified with that little sheep that was on Jesus' shoulder in one of these pictures, you know, or um, Jesus knocking on the door of my heart, or uh, Jesus beside the mariner. There's this young boy who's about 10 years old. He's on a <laughs> sailing ship, and Jesus is right there. I get goosebumps just talking about it. That, that was my Jesus. That was, that was the unmanifesting appearing to me in this, in this painting. I thought it was a photograph, but it turns out it was actually a painting by Warner Solomon who was a businessman and had a, a revelation, had a spiritual awakening of Jesus. And he painted what he saw in his heart. And that's the Jesus he came up with. And that's the Jesus that then got distributed to every Lutheran church in America <laughs> and helped get us through the Second World War. You know? So that's the unmanifest becoming manifest. That's just a little example. Later we learn that was Werner Salman's vision. It's not necessarily mine not necessarily anyone else's, but he shared that with everybody. What a beautiful thing to do, and it helps so many of us. Um, but we know that's not Jesus, that Jesus is unmanifest. Even the people who saw Jesus didn't know it was Jesus. You know, they, uh, Mary thought it was the gardener, you know, or the road to Emmaus story. They didn't know who they were talking to. Why? Because Jesus, the form of Jesus was, was uh, transparent. It was transparent. Some people saw what he was transparent to, eternity. Some people didn't see it. It's our responsibility and our gift that we can attune our consciousness to see eternity through the forms that we're given in our Christian tradition. So, the second person is the beloved. And um, Jesus says, um, I am in the Father. I am in the Father. This is in John. Farewell address. I am, I am in my Father. And you in me. And I am in you and the Father's in us. So here's Jesus self-emptying. Everything he's realizing from the unmanifest and unnamed and sharing it with us. He's not holding anything back. My joy I give to you. Um, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you. It's that self-emptying. And, um, and you will bear much fruit. Uh, all mine are... Oh, first he says, uh, everything the Father has is mine. That is, the unnamed, unnameable is in me. I come from there, I go to there, and I give that to you. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And... Uh, you know, isn't that beautiful? Like this, this self-emptying story just carries on and on. So, this this dimension of our experience as Christians is the I-Thou dimension. That the unnameable, who we cannot touch, we cannot name, shows up as a person who we can have a relationship with. And it also tells us that the I-Thou is not something ancillary. It's not something uh, less than the realization of the first person. Actually, the, the I-Thou is an ultimate dimension for Christians, it's something ultimate. And I say this because it's a little different from the Hindu tradition and the Buddhist tradition. You don't have as strong an emphasis on I-Thou in either one of those traditions. I know Buddhism the best, both the Vipassana Insight Meditation and Zen, uh, and some Tibetan that I've experienced myself. And it's you have a relationship with the Dalai Lama, for example, if you're a devoted person, and there's something like an I-Thou going on there. 
but it's not quite like the Christian eye, though. There's a little bit of difference, and I, if we had that one-week retreat I was talking about, then I think we could explore that a little bit more. But I just want to emphasize that Christian tradition. We don't give up. We don't say that I thou is something le less deep, in a, in a sense, than ultimate reality, uh, than the unnameable. Then we have the third person. Now, in Christian script, uh, in Jewish scripture, in Genesis, the creator, the creator is named as uh, the Hebrew word is uh, Elohim, Elohim, and uh, Elohim is uh, a plural word, um, and we have this phrase that the Creator creates us in our image, in our image. God says our, as if there's a plurality in God. God's not one thing. Again, this word God is, sounds like one thing, one person, if you will. Um, but God is a plurality. And it's easy for us as Christians to say perichoresis, yeah, right there in Genesis, even though it's Jewish, uh, where they don't have the same kind of belief in triunity as we do. But there is that, that glimpse of plurality right there at the beginning of Genesis. Elohim creates everything through ruah, through the wind of the spirit. The wind of the spirit is there right at the beginning as part of creation. Um, and so, so we have spirit. And I, I have this phrase, the love that flows between. Um, and this comes from St. Augustine, 5th century, 6th century. St. Augustine's famous book, the Confessions, that he wrote, and uh, a treatise called De Trinitatis, on the Trinity. He says that, uh, that the Trinity is the lover, the beloved, and the love that flows between. The lover, the beloved, and the love that flows between. The lover is God, creating creation out of love. The beloved is the second person of the Trinity, who we are. And the, and the love that flows between is the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's the elastic, enlivening, uh, creative power of love is the Spirit. And it comes through the first and the second persons, right through, and it continues. And uh, I believe this. I believe this. And I, got, I really found the courage to name the Holy Spirit in my spiritual life through Henry Nouwen, who used to, who did that. And I was always kind of embarrassed for that. I mean, having been educated at Harvard, to say um, thank you, Holy Spirit, out loud, or even mention Jesus at Harvard. Yet the Divinity School can be problematic. And Henry was very. Henry taught at the Harvard <coughs> Divinity School, and he he put it right out there. He, he taught about Jesus, but so I do this. I, I feel that the Holy Spirit is is something real, something ultimate, and is here among us. And the Holy Spirit is seeking that we become the body of Christ, that we become this community of love, that we embody the perichoresis. That's what we're meant to do. So this is the dance: first, second, third, and back again to the beginning. And it's all a flow. And there's a little Episcopal church, I'm going to stop in a second. There's a little Episcopal church in um, Ashfield where we, we have a little place up in the hill towns. And up in the top of the church is this stained glass window. I don't know if you can see this. You've, you've seen this at various places. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hand this out. But what this is, is um, Deus, God, uh, Pater, Filius, Spiritus Sanctus. The Father is not the Son. The Father is God. God is the Father. The God is the Son. The Son is, is God. But the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not the Father. But the Father is the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit, is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. So it's a not and. It's another paradox. It was right at the heart of our tradition are these beautiful paradoxes. Is and is not. Eternity and finitude. All these things are happening at once and they're happening now. We're living this, in a sense. To me, that's the most beautiful interpretation of the Trinity is it's something to live. And so that's what we're being invited into. And, and I know we have to go to a liturgy in a second. So I will say, Thank you very much. And I'm sorry, we haven't had time to exchange more, but maybe next time I come, we can do that. Okay? Thank you.
Yeah. I think we, we could. Have I think time we we still have time. We still yes. have a little time. Oh, do we? oh yes. Another five or six minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, can, could you pass these out? Thank you. Thank you. So, so I just covered a, a week's worth of discussion and, <laughs> and exploration and prayer, and that's what we'd have if we could do this for a week. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering uh, any any questions or observations. When are you coming back is my question. <laughs> <laughs> Next year. Next winter. Oh. Yeah. You come down every winter? Yep. Oh, yeah. I remember yes. that. Yeah. Make sure I'm you're down 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 Because <laughs> when Uber voted, it was in German, and it, it was Ich und Du. Yeah. And thou does not convey in English. Yeah. What do does in German. Do is very intimate, familiar term for yeah. your closest friends and whatnot. Whereas thou in English, at least modern English, is something we use for something that's holy and kind mm -hmm. of Yeah, yeah, you're right. Other. Other. Yeah, way away from us. Yeah. Boo. Yep. Uh, Martin Boover's book that you're talking about, um, that I thou book, you're right, it can do. Um, let me just, that's a really good point. It's a wonderful book. It's really informed me. Uh, he says that we alternate between I, thou, and I, it. And when we treat others and the natural world as it, we distance ourselves. We separate ourselves. As soon as we walk into a room, we have opinions about people. This is, I, I, I learned this on a long, silent retreat, uh, insight meditation, that somebody totally irritated me because they always wore red. <laughs> or somebody totally irritated me because he was always scratching behind his ear. Like, Why does he do that? And I'm sitting silent for a week, being irritated by my opinions, <laughs> my own opinions. And that's treating others as it's, you know. Or the natural world. We think we can bulldoze all other creatures out of the planet so that humans can take over and dominate it. That's I it. But to treat the planet and other people as thou. Uh, Buber's point was that something happens, something deep and exciting happens when we look into somebody's eyes and we allow a, free, a space of freedom from our opinions and we're really present to someone. That that, we could say in the Christian tradition, that's the, I, that's the Christ consciousness we're talking about. That Jesus was so mindful of making contact with people in, in a real way without itting them Itting them, <laughs> you know, a verb, uh, that, that he was right there. And, and that's why he could touch people so deeply. Any other uh, minute or two? <laughs> cramming so much in here. <clears throat> I want to say something about the Athanasian Creed? Yeah, the Athanasian Creed, yeah. Because yeah, it's still hey. out there. Hey, nice to see you. Too. It says everything that you need to know about the Trinity, much more than <laughs> is possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, in the one week version we would do, cover the Athanasian <laughs> Creed too and talk about it. Now, I, I just want to mention, just we do have to stop, but uh, Margaret has this little book that I haven't read fully by David Steinorast. Do you know the, uh, uh, is he Benedictine? I think he's Benedictine out in Big Sur. He's written a wonderful book on the Apostles' Creed, going through it word by word, line by line, in a more spiritual way. Not just as a creed you recite wrote, but really exploring it. What's the name of it? I forgot the name of the book. I can get it for you if you're interested. But, or, or you go to David Steinorass's website called gratefulness.org. Is that right? Yeah. Gratefulness.org. And it's a beautiful little book. Uh, it'll change your perception of what, the, what a creed is. Oh, yeah. So I think we need to bow. Thank you very much. It's thank been you. wonderful to be here. And thank you so much. And I'll think of you as part of my, my Christian community. That we're, Absolutely. We're, we're dancing the Trinity. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you.